Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cure Talks. I'm Priya Menon, your host. Today on Cure Talks, we are discussing new findings in gastrointestinal cancer with Dr. Alan P. Binuk from UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. Talking to Dr. Vinuk on the patient panel are patient advocates Daniel Ripley Burgess, Kurt Pessman, Aki Smith, and Kim Hall Jackson. Uh, to get the show started without any further delay, we have with us the Madden Family Distinguished Professor of Medical Oncology and Translational Research at the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center, Dr. Alan P. Vinuk. Uh, Dr. Vinuk, such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, doctor, I'm going to start with some very basic questions and then hand over to the patient panel for their questions. Uh, so my first question is um, that GI cancer umbrella includes many cancers. Uh, can you discuss some of the novel agents and therapeutic approaches that are the standard of care for gastrointestinal cancers today? Well, um, as opposed to a lot of the cancer, the way we characterize cancer these days, gastrointestinal cancer is a pretty broad brush. Um, now, they're related because they're all in the same, uh, have the same part of the functional part of the body, but of course, uh, colon cancer may be very different than stomach cancer. Uh, and included in this is pancreas cancer and neuroendocrine cancers of the GI tract. So there's a great deal of variety. Um, unfortunately, one of the overarching themes of GI, gastrointestinal cancer is that the checkpoint inhibitors have very little activity. The immune therapies have very little activity in these cancers um, as a rule. Now, stomach cancer and anal cancer, there's a bit of activity, but colon or pancreas cancer, really there's very little activity of the checkpoint inhibitors. So there is some impediment to the immune system's effect on these cancers. Um, in terms of other, other therapies, obviously, uh, we do have targeted therapies, but uh, similarly, uh, the, the, there's less targeted therapy than, for example, in lung cancer, where there may be discrete mutations in EGFR, for example, that we can target with any number of new uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. For GI cancer, uh, there tends to be less, uh, less specific targets, uh, less, less uh, ability to target one, treat one, uh, one pathway and make a big impact. Uh, and so, so th this in many ways has kept led the GI cancer to trail behind the other cancers in terms of the rapid rate of progress. There are exceptions. Um, for example, the so-called GI stromal tumor, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Now, that tends to be cancer that the sar it's a, it used to be characterized as a sarcoma, and so lots of folks in the sarcoma field like to claim it as their own. Uh, this is a unique disease. Uh, again, this is the exception that makes a rule, I suppose, for GI cancers. Because GI stromal tumor, there's actually a, an addiction to a single pathway called the C-KIT pathway, and the drug uh, Gleevec or Matinib actually is dramatically effective in that disease. So that's the exception that makes a rule. By and large, these are complex cancers that have, uh, don't respond to a single intervention or a single pathway and uh, it's been daunting to try to make progress in these. Um, on the other hand, they're common. GI cancers account for uh, somewhere around 40% of all solid tumors and uh, certainly uh, cause a great deal of morbidity. Uh, so, um, you know, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, we, again, we have a broad, it's a broad brush, a broad program, and within the different diseases, uh, many things uh, mm -hmm. are, are different. So I, I would... We can take those sort of separately as a, in general. It's not like prostate cancer or breast cancer. This GI cancer is a, is a very, um, there's a, a wide range of uh, diseases and issues. Correct, right. Uh, uh, Dr. Venuk, uh, I know you have been in, in this field for so long uh, with your vast experience. I'm, I'm sure we are seeing a lot of new breakthrough treatments for cancer in the last few years, like uh, immunotherapy, CAR T cells, biomarkers, and more. So uh, what, what among these developments or diagnosis of treatments of GI cancer has impressed, impressed you uh, in the recent years? Well, um, I, as I said, a part of one of the most impressive things, unfortunately, is is that some of the things we would hope to work, we haven't been able to get to work, uh, and so that would be, mm -hmm. the, let's say, the immune therapies. On the other hand, 
Uh, we've discovered that some treatments targeting uh, amplified genes, such as the HER2 gene therapies, can work in stomach cancer, for example, uh, with uh, anti-HER2 therapy. Um, we, we've seen that some cancers are, are curable. One of the unique things about GI cancers is that as opposed to almost every other solid tumor, GI cancers can still be cured even after they metastasized, which we see in, in colon and rectal cancer, for example. So, it, you know, those are the those are the things that we that stand out as opportunities uh, that uh, that we need to capitalize on as we're to, as we're looking at patients and trying to decide how best to handle them. Uh, probably the big missing link in GI cancers is that more so than any other cancers, the RAS KRAS mutation is a driving force in many of these cancers. And because that's such a difficult uh, mutation to deal with, uh, that may very well account for our, our problems going forward. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think that, as well as the, the evolving role of multidisciplinary care, the fact that, uh, that, as I said, we can cure patients occasionally, even if with metastatic disease, sets us apart. Mm -hmm. uh, could you uh, give us, uh, please give us some suggestions on um, uh, preventing it? Um, are there some risk factors that have been identified? I'm talking about GI cancers as a broad uh, group. And uh, yeah. probably some methods for early detection of these cancers. Yeah. Well, so we, of course, have screening programs, for example, for colon cancer, because 85% uh, mm -hmm. of colon cancers evolve from polyps, and it takes between three to 10 years for a polyp to turn into a malignancy. By intervening with a colonoscopy, you can almost, you can prevent many of these cancers if you find them early enough. That's the basis upon which we do screening colonoscopy. And we start doing that at the age 50. Unfortunately, as we'll talk about in a little bit, colon cancer has evolved over the last decade to seem to be affecting younger people much more so than the average it used to be mostly a disease of older folks, but uh, so 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 that's a screening opportunity. For example, uh, gastric stomach cancer what used to be the most common cancer a uh, hundred years ago, uh, and it all but it, it was decreased dramatically with the advent of the refrigerator, because it used to be that uh, meats and other uh, other items that were perishable were were sort of uh, cured with nitrites and and bad chemicals which uh, tended to lead to patients, people being at risk for upper GI cancer. So we changed that by getting refrigeration, although now probably lifestyle, uh, sort of type A personality is associated with an increased incidence of upper GI cancers. And then one of the most uh, dominant cancers around the world, liver cancer, uh, occurs uh, really in, in, in folks who have had a, a diseased livers which, as you know, around the world is, has historically been caused mostly by hepatitis with endemic hepatitis, let's say, in hepatitis B in, in, in Africa and Asia, hepatitis C in Japan and in the U.S. And now that we're getting rid of hepatitis C, we're, tried, we're changing places with uh, what's called the metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty uh, liver disease, which predisposes to liver cancer. So, so obviously, if you can prevent... Uh, if you prevent liver damage, if you can, uh, if you do colonoscopy screening, certainly people who adhere to non-Western diets uh, have a great lesser risk of all of these cancers. Generally, smoking, of course, is associated with a cancer risk as in almost in every group, including in GI cancers. So, so um, certainly those factors are those are important factors. Although there are no absolutes, people who are vegetarians or who don't uh, don't drink alcohol can get any of these cancers. So, uh, as with uh, with uh, as, as we know in other diseases, there are no absolutes. But uh, that's a, as a general theme. Those are the kinds of things we think about for GI cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dr. Venuk. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, the patient panel. Uh, the first member uh, on the panel today is Daniel Ripley Burgess. Daniel is a two-time colon cancer survivor. Uh, first diagnosed at the age 17, an award-winning communications professional and the author of Blush, How I Barely Survived, 17. So she writes and speaks to encourage others that faith can survive. Daniel, all yours. Hello. Thank you for having me today. 
Um, I have a I have a question actually. Um, I'm a survivor. I've survived for about 20 years, but I I have a close friend who was recently diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer, and um, it's having me relive some of that with her. So the moment of her diagnosis has been so overwhelming, and I found that she was in more of a local hospital and just getting rushed into care, especially um, in the season of COVID. So just a question, like, what would your advice be to someone in her situation if they're at more of a local medical center that doesn't do research or trials? Like, what should what should she do? That's a good question. So for the most part, uh, no cancer diagnosis, very rarely is a cancer diagnosis a cause to panic and to do something emergent. Um, there are the exceptions. Let's say somebody with a colon cancer who has a bowel obstruction can't, can't eat or has intense abdominal pain, that, that may require immediate intervention. But for the most part, uh, these GI cancers, you're much wiser to wait, uh, get, you know, get, round up the extent of the disease, make sure you've been fully staged. And I do think, now this is a bias, of course, in, in, in coming from me at a major center may seem like it's, uh, it's self-serving. But I do believe that every patient should solicit an opinion from experts at a, at a major center. More and more, I think, imagining that a primary oncologist out in the community can have enough expertise across a range of diseases to make sure they're pulling, pushing the right buttons is, is, is really asking a lot. So a patient who's newly diagnosed these days, uh, it, and if it's not emergent, uh, it, you know, I think getting another opinion over, the, over a week or two or three is probably well worth it as opposed to jumping into a treatment that may set uh, may, may sort of set up obstacles going forward very much as we as we evolve we know that uh, in many cases with with gi cancer chemotherapy or radiation is where we start as opposed to surgery so uh, i think that's very important for folks who are newly diagnosed to take a deep breath and pause and and try to you know get other opinions now in the covid era uh, this is this is a different <laughs> Totally different. I, I spent the last few weeks helping to develop guidelines for oncologists for the NCCN about how to treat patients in the era of a pandemic, which is to say, what what don't we do? What can we get away without? Uh, sort of what compromises, and and that's sort of always been anathema to me. But that that is our current era. So to a patient newly diagnosed these days, uh, many centers uh, can't do surgery because elective surgery. Uh, which is what this is most colon, most GI cancer is elective surgery at least at the outset. Uh, most places are not doing them or scaling back on that. So that's a whole level of complexity that we've never anticipated. But in, in that instance and in any instance, I think patients should take a deep breath and solicit a, a second opinion. We're doing a lot of video opinions these days, which I was never a big fan of, but actually worked very well in the current system and we probably will go much more to that in the future because it's much more efficient for patients and actually for doctors as well. Your friend, for example, could could certainly call in, depending on where they live, they could call in to a local place and uh, and get a video visit. There's a te- technically speaking, we can't do video visits across state lines. This is bizarre, but got to do with uh, with with the with the uh, with uh, trans, trans, transiting across state borders regarding payments. So it's kind of crazy, but that's a technicality. They may change that in this era because of the need to go to video visits, but that, that's the reality. That is what one of the things we face, believe it or not. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you. That's super helpful and mm-hmm. encouraging. Um, mm mm-hmm. Does the latest research support any naturopathic therapies in addition to traditional therapies for the GI cancers? Well, so um, certainly there's evidence that diet, uh, but there are a number of, of, of studies that have suggested diet exercise uh, matters. Um, this was mostly done back in the 90s and, and early 2000s in a big study looking at the role of chemotherapy in patients with stage three colon cancer, we embedded uh, questionnaires that looked at many lifestyle decisions that patients had. So ranging from do they smoke to do they exercise to how many, how many, how many uh, 
how many portions of nuts do they have during the course of the week? Uh, do they eat to fish? What kind of fish? What diet, etc.? And through all of those questionnaires, we've developed a data set that really suggests that food and exercise, all these things do matter in terms of survival uh, and even curability of colon cancer. Mechanisms, that I, we can speculate as to how that, why that would be, but but so the classic recommendation we make to patients is is a non-Western diet, so uh, avoid in and out burger kind of. Um, you go to, you have, uh, eat, eat a lot of, good portion of nuts. Now these are tree nuts, not peanuts. Peanuts are legumes. Tree nuts would be what seems to help. Uh, and then you've got, uh, as I said, um, you know, uh, fish uh, is good, is better than not. Uh, incredibly enough sugar beverages are bad watching too much tv is bad and that probably is because people don't exercise much so those are the lifestyle factors we know of in terms of other naturopathic uh, things well harder to say i'm a big believer in vitamin d um 80 percent of us are insufficient in vitamin d because we we tend to shield ourselves from the sun uh, so vitamin d I, i'm a believer in supplementing the patients trying to get their levels to the normal uh, and then aspirin is not exactly naturopathic, although it's a natural substance. Uh, that also is, appears to pr be pr a little bit protective about developing colon cancer. That's really helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so my last question is um, something I'm facing. So, you know, in the era of COVID, you know, there's clinical trials that are closing, and then there's also, um, like, scans. I think you mentioned this a few minutes ago. So I have Lynch syndrome and need a follow-up scan every year, for example. Um, but it's been put on hold. And so for survivors, a lot of our follow-ups are, are on hold, which is causing extra anxiety. So just curious what your advice to patients is right now, kind of in this crazy era. Well, uh, you, call, you know, it may, my advice today may change tomorrow. Um, we are, so for what it's worth, in, in San Francisco, we are starting to open up again. We're, to, we're very, very carefully bringing people back in. We're, we're testing patients when they come in the door. I mean, obviously, the reason not to get scans is, is for the most part, if you don't know somebody's in the status of the virus, and they happen to be shedding virus, and they lay in a, in a CT scan or MRI for half hour. They, that space is contaminated, and there's a great risk of disseminating the virus. And not to mention that patients, with patients with cancer or, or survivors, you'd like to not expose to the virus because intuitively worry that they they may do less well with the virus. Although that, that's not actually certain. I think. What I would predict is that while this, there will be a new normal, I think waiting a month or two, by and large, is not a big big uh, problem for certainly patients who are survivors. And uh, I do understand that it increases the anxiety, but uh, I just think that uh, it, it's a trade-off of anxieties, I suppose. Um, this COVID year, though, is really, as I said, it's forced all of us to rethink how we do things. And... Um, I'm not comfortable with some of the decisions we've had to make, but uh, but it is what it is. Um, so I, I would I would trust them that we are we first we are, we are pushing back and starting to get back towards our normal behavior. And I would I would just hold out over the next month or two. You should be able to get back at least to the approximately normal schedule you were on before. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Dr. Vanuk, next on the panel is a patient of yours, Kurt Pessman. Kurt is a seven-time author, documentary producer, colon cancer survivor, and an award-winning writer who has published with Esquire, GQ, Men's Health, Cure, as well as in the New York Times. Uh, Kurt, you're on. I have to be careful what he asks me here. He knows too much about me. Hi, Kurt. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Doing well. Thanks again, everyone, and especially Dr. Vanuk who in my book is noted as one of the seven people, although there are probably more, including nurses, who did save my life. So an extra extra special thank you there. Um, I wanted to start today with, um, again, what I learned way back in 2001, but it's still a, an increasingly 
an important question. Can you explain to, uh, to the listeners why the treatment regimens are so different for colon cancer and rectal cancer when it seems like the microbiomes or the, the tissues would be pretty similar? Well, that's a great question. So actually, they're less different now than they were years ago as we understand more about the cancer. Certainly when you were treated rectal, with rectal cancer, we, uh, we viewed it very differently. Uh, there's a mechanical reason why we treat rectal cancer differently than colon cancer, and that is the, the limited ability of surgeons to get into the pelvis to do a, a complete rectal operation. And that was much more the case 20 years ago than it is today with newer technology, newer equipment, newer stapling devices, with robotic surgery. We can, surgeons can now do a better job down in the pelvis. It used to be very difficult to, to get all around the cancer and get an adequate margin in rectal cancers. So back in the, in the you, know, two, uh, you know, three, four decades ago, we started doing radiation to the pelvis, and that was really to augment the ability to get a clean surgical margin, surgery by and large being the definitive treatment for most cancers, and certainly that was the case for colon cancer. So, so when you were treated, we, we did focus on radiation. More and more these days, with more effective chemotherapy and better surgery, we're doing less radiation. In fact, we just completed a very large study in selected patients, randomly assigning patients with high rectal cancer to actually see if we can get away without radiation at all. And that, that so-called prospect trial we're waiting for results on. Similarly, rectal cancer these days, we're also treating with chemotherapy before we do anything as opposed to chemoradiation, which is how we used to start. Um, and again, the field is evolving for colon cancer as well. So uh, the differences may be much less today than they were years ago. Uh, I should say that, that, in fact, as we think about colon cancer or rectal cancer, we've now evolved to believing that rectal cancer, which is defined for purposes of studies and understanding they're talking the same language, the last 12 centimeters of the large intestine is called the rectum, and from there to the rest of, uh, around to the appendix, that would be called the colon. We used to think there's a bigger difference between the colon and the rectum, and now we actually think there's a much bigger difference biologically in behavior of the cancer for cancers that originate on the proximal side of the colon. That would be between the appendix and the, uh, and the liver, the hepatic flexure, and then cancers that uh, originate beyond the hepatic flexure, the so-called, those are left-sided cancers, and the cancers on the, before the hepatic flexure are called right-sided cancers. Patients appear to do very differently in, if you look, if you bifurcate at that point as opposed to rectum and colon. Colon and rectum, by and large, are molecularly very the same. It turns out the biome, the microbiome, is different on the right side of the colon than the left. There's sort of a gradual change in bacteria that populate the different parts of the colon that may explain why there's a difference in outcome. Uh, from, a, from an embryologic perspective, it shouldn't be that surprising because the right side of the colon originates from what's called the mid-gut and the left side of the colon from the hind gut in the embryo. And then during, as, as the embryo evolves, those two parts of the, of the uh, embryo join up to form the colon. Uh, so, so, again, we're, we've sort of figured out the rectum is not so different than the colon, although years ago we thought they were very different. That's great. Um, I didn't. I didn't know you. You've just caught us up on a lot of probably the last ten years about the um, the diagnoses being more similar than they were even in the the last era. Um, my next question actually has to do with uh, testing. We had a uh, a recent uh, patient advocate and research advocate seminar in which a researcher talked about measuring breath, volatile organic oh, hmm. compounds to try yeah. to get at maybe an, an early uh, look at it, another way to diagnose or pre-diagnose cancers in the same way, you know, we used to think about liquid biopsies or blood might be able to tell us what's going on even without a biopsy. And now they're trying to look at, uh, for GI cancers, to look at uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds. My question is, even though it's, it's turned out to be very helpful in early studies to measure breath, again, it may seem out of the box or strange, but 
Do you know any doctors or researchers who have ever thought to mention to measure flatulence or gas to even get closer to the VOCs to try to guess what's going on in the GI tract? Sounds strange, but you well, never I, know. Well, I expect strange from you. So, um, no, that, those <laughs> are really you. great questions. A really great question. So the issue, it turns out the vol, the, the, there's even called something called volatomics, which is studying the, the, the toxins that come out in our breath. And basically, these volatile organic compounds are the breakdown product of our cellular death, right? Our cells are always turning over hair cells, muc mucous membrane cells, things like that. And so we do expire some of these, these, uh, these compounds it's very hard to measure. You literally need liquid chromatography. So if you think the COVID virus testing is difficult, this would be extraordinarily difficult and very, uh, very meticulous. And, and so these VOCs are best characterized in lung cancer patients. Uh, I'd say they're much less characterized, less well characterized in GI cancer. It's been very difficult to do that. So, so here's, there's interest in that, but I wouldn't say we've gotten very far. The issue, though, of so the microbiome. Not, or, go ahead. I was just going to say it's nothing like a breathalyzer. That's way, way too simple. Correct, because these 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 compounds are in infinitesimal, uh, uh, you know, amounts. Now that may be enough to to give you a heads up, but you really need to do amazingly complex and and you know detailed analysis of the breath. So right now, it's just not, it's not ready for prime time. Great thought, but I think we have work to do. The, the issue that you raised, though, about the, the flatulence is a very smart issue because, um, because there, we have a lot of effort. Of course, flatulence and gas is related to the microbiome, what, what inhabits our microbiome. Clearly, different people have different uh, features. The microbiome, uh, for, the, for people listening who aren't familiar with that term, that's sort of the... the, the community of bacteria and fungi and everything else that live in our, in, our, in our guts, it is said, and I don't know who counted them, but it said there are more microbiome elements in our body than cells in our body. I mean, so we're just a walking zoo of these, these weird little creatures. And clearly they have a lot to do with, uh, with our ability to di digest foods, with many, many things. We think it, it's really a big and very important in, in interacting with the immune system. And the reason is, if you can imagine this, the, the GI tract, the gut, is full of these bacteria and these elements that, you know, there must be a sort of a mutual non-aggression pact between the human body and these bacterial elements or fungal elements because we let them coexist. And so, so we think that may explain why the GI tract cancers don't respond to immune therapies because somehow or other the immune system is not, does not do its normal work in the GI tract because of its, the ability to leave these bacteria and these other items alone. Now, so irregularities in the microbiome is, are incredibly important in all sort of colitis and inflammatory bowel disease and probably in different GI cancers and we're studying that aggressively. We have a huge effort in that, a few centers around the country are doing this, looking at younger people to see if there's a difference in microbiome and their risks of cancer, to see if people who, let's say, have a non-Western diet, do they change their microbiome? These are all things that are very difficult to know because, first of all, if you sample the microbiome, you change it, right? Because even introducing a, a tube or taking an antibiotic or anything would, will change the makeup of that community of, of, of organisms. Uh, so, so that's one thing, but also there's so many of these organisms, it, even figuring out which end is up requires immense computer technology, and only recently have we, do we have enough computer power. So the microbiome is a very big area, and that is in the flatulence issues, that, that, that's an example of the kinds of things we're looking at. There's a company called Second Genome in the area around here in the Bay Area, which is very, very cool. They're looking at things that you find in our stool that these elements that may in fact be markers of cancer, not the, the so-called coligard, which is looking for RAS mutations in cells, but looking at the kinds of, you know, elements you're, you're, you're asking about. But it's, it, the problem is there's so much, in, there's so much there 
And again, just as with the breath, co breath collecting these tissues and analyzing them is not so easy. So uh, it sounds sure. sounds sounds easy, but it isn't. Well, last real quick question because I know time is tight. Uh, you probably have forgotten this, Dr. Vinuk, but about 17 years ago, I read a study and asked you about aspirin because it seemed very promising. And uh, for a long-range survivor question, and as you were leaving a, a meeting hall, you looked back at me when I said, would you advise somebody like me to take aspirin? Because it was early, but it was very encouraging. And you actually looked back at me and you said, well, I wouldn't advise against it. That was quite cautious, but it was a good answer, I guess, all these years later. Thanks very much. Sure. You're welcome. I still take aspirin to this day. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Dr. Venak, our next patient panel guest is Aki Smith. Aki is a caregiver and patient advocate for her father, who was diagnosed with advanced stomach cancer. Uh, she's also founder and executive director of Hope for Stomach Cancer, a nonprofit organization that provides resources to patients, caregivers, and loved ones facing stomach cancer. Aki, please ask your questions. Hi, thank you so much for having me on, on today. I really appreciate it. I wanted to know, um, so gastric cancer is devastating and survival is uh, measured in months as opposed to years. What's currently being done to give hope to stage four patients and how do, what, what steps do we need to take in order to start treating this as a chronic disease? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's asking a lot in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, it is. You know, the problem with, many cancers is if we could find them early enough, we could probably impact their, their outcomes much better. Uh, in Asia, for example, there's routine upper endoscopy done because stomach and esophage, upper esophageal cancers are so common. Not done in much of the rest of the world. And if you don't find these diseases until they're advanced, it's hard to say that you can make much impact in any of them. Uh, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, these cancers don't usually cause symptoms until they damage it cause uh, quite a lot of turmoil in their organ. The stomach is like a is like a muscular bag, and it basically it's there to hold food and propel it through the body, you know, to move it on in the GI tract. And cancers have to be really extensive to impact the ability of the stomach to work. So so you you rarely get enough of an advance warning. Sometimes a little bleeding or something you might catch a break. But uh, but short of that, short of sort of finding ways of early diagnosis, I think our ability to change to really make a big impact in this in that disease is is really difficult. Uh, uh, we do know from the from the tumor cancer genome atlas studies, which have basically analyzed primary cancers for molecular features, we know that there are some features that may uh, give us a little handle on how we can treat GI stomach cancer better, but in fact, because we don't usually know about it until it's too late, we don't routinely do screening, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bad disease, as you said. Yeah, so follow up to that question then. You know, per peritoneal metastasis is very common, and it's really difficult to treat. I mean, I saw that you've written some studies on IP chemotherapy. Uh, what are some of your take on PIPEC, HIPEC, and some cold IP therapy? Right. I'm not a big, I think there are selective patients who may benefit from HIPEC. HIPEC is heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. The idea is that you can, there's some cancers that don't invade into organs, but actually just sort of spread on the surfaces of the abdominal cavity in the, what's called the peritoneum. Uh, the best example of that probably is ovarian cancer. Uh, in, in GI tract, there are some cancers that tend to do that. The stomach cancer is one, pancreas cancer is another. Um, so, so the idea with HIPEC is you, you, you essentially bathe the surfaces in chemotherapy and you may get better delivery of the treatment. The heated part is sort of a little bit of a wishful, sort of wishful thinking. He, this was started years ago. We've, studies have never distinguished whether the heated part is necessary for the effect of the intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And in truth, in fact, we don't know that any of those treatments matter as much as when you do high tech, the surgeons will generally go in and do a very extensive removal of all the cancer they can see 
And that may, in and of itself may be the difference in outcomes for those patients. There have just, just been two large randomized studies of HIPEC in patients whose cancers appear to be confined to the peritoneal cavity, and in neither case did the HIPEC improve outcome. Uh, so I think there are selected patients who probably get benefit, but uh, but it's just a very tough disease. And, and unlike what you might sort of intuit, it uh, turns out that patients with peritoneal cancer have much worse prognosis than patients with liver metastases, for example. And that's because peritoneal involvement tends to change the, the functionality of the intestines, the ability for peristalsis to be normal, and patients lose weight and feel much worse of ounce for ounce for their cancer. So it's a terrible problem right now and not an area where we've made a lot of headway. Uh, studies have been done recently, though, and certainly high tech is not an answer on average. Okay. Well, thank you. And my last question is, um, more about clinical trials and the clinical trial design. Some of these clinical trials look so similar. How do we help patients connect the dots on clinical trials that are very similar? Huh. Well, it's a good question, obviously. Um, the reason they're very similar is, in general, you're asking, you know, compare, comparing the, the old to the new or, you know, standard to something different or better than standard. Um, so, so, I mean, it depends on what, what the circumstances are. I think with any clinical trial, really the question you're going to ask is what are the risk benefits, what, what are the chances of doing better than the standard? In general, these studies have to have what's called equipoise. So, so in general, people have to believe there's enough similarity in, or likelihood in outcomes that you can justify patients participating in one or the other in a random fashion. Now, much of the research we do at a place like mine, UCSF, where we're looking to develop new treatments, we mostly do studies that are not sort of randomized, but studies that really look at either standard plus something or entirely different approaches. But for a given patient, you know, it's very hard. It's a hard question. You need to sort of see what the standards are. Uh, I, I would emphasize that that new is not necessarily better. So, so many patients assume that well. If this is a study looking at, at drug X, that must be really good because they were they studied otherwise. Well, in many cases, we're hoping drug X is good, but we have no idea if it is. So patients need to take stock of what the choices are and really spend time doing their homework. I think in the community, by and large, the studies tend to be industry-driven, which are companies asking a question that would, at the end of the day, hopefully help patients but also help their bottom line. Um, and I think so, so before any patient partic participates in a study, whatever the disease, it's probably worth getting another opinion just to make sure that other people think that the study is asking a valid question and that patients actually stand to benefit. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Aki. Uh, Dr. Venok, next in the panel is Kim Hall Jackson. Uh, Kim is one of the nation, one of uh, a nation's leading colon cancer advocates and a strong voice extolling the need for cancer screening. Uh, Kim, please ask your questions. Yeah, and thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess my initial question was in reference to your clinical design, um, the number of African American and people of color getting asked that access to clinical trials has always been a challenge. I do know that you guys have done something to um, make it more accessible in terms of financial and transportation, but I think my question is more about people of color feeling comfortable um, in a clinical trial um, and just feeling like they're getting a fair share based on, yeah. you know, social and historic issues. Um, we, we need to overcome that uh, to increase the comfort level so more people will have accessibility. And I just wanted to know what your organization or what you thought about that process. Well, I totally agree with you. I think there's a certain, there's a many cases cultural and demographic mm -hmm. bias and, and concern about participating in research. And I think uh, the African American community in particular uh, doesn't have to have a long memory to think back to some of the egregious things that were done to, let's say, study the natural history of syphilis, for example, which is one of the 
mm-hmm. lights on one of the shames of our profession from many years ago. Um, you know, we we do try to uh, in, increase access to people for people of color to participate in research trials. Uh, it's it's a function though of whether they have access to the health system, their level of sophistication, their means. All of these things play a role. What I would say is that we, we just, actually I just now I just we just submitted a manuscript last, this week on a big study we did in colon cancer where about 12% of the participants were African American. This is out of 2,000 patients. And those patients did exactly the same as patients who are not who are white or other in our in our group, as opposed to right. broadly speaking, we, we know that African Americans, pound for pound, stage for stage, do worse with cancer. And mm-hmm. the assumption then is that that's because of access to care, and uh, mm-hmm. as more so than than inherent biology. So, so how do we fix that? Well, it's a, it's a daunting challenge. Talking about it doesn't mean we can fix it. At our place at UCSF, we, we work very hard at trying to encourage African American participation, but it's easier said than done. They have to have access, patients have to have access to the system, have to know about it. So um, we try, and I think we, we haven't done very well. Just looking at the COVID, at the COVID experience, you see a, 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 a horrible example of the differential, it, what difference race makes, race and demographics and socioeconomic status, because unfortunately we're seeing African Americans doing much more poorly than others with COVID, for example, and that probably is related to the nature of the work that, that, that these folks tend to do where they often are out in the front lines doing a lot of things behind the scenes, Maybe not, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is, these tend to be uh, deep jobs that are populated frequently by people of color. And, and mm-hmm. so, so this, this shines a light on our inequities, but fixing them, it's, we can talk about it, but doing it, it's very hard to know how we can do that. I mean, super challenge and not, wow. not very satisfactory progress so far, I must say. I appreciate that. I appreciate that feedback because it is a super challenge and it is easier to discuss than it is actually to do it. So uh, I thank you for acknowledging that and I appreciate the steps that your organization has begun to make. Um, I only have two questions. And my my other is that I'm probably a non-traditional colorectal cancer patient. You know, I was 45 when I was diagnosed. Um, I'm a dancer, have really great exercise. Um, I'm a pescatarian, and I was diagnosed. Is that a religion um, or do you eat fish? (laughs) Yes. Yep. You you eat fish as opposed to being, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Everything else is vegetarian, but I do eat fish. So at the time of my diagnosis, when I was 45, they were still saying, and this was 2008, that you should be tested at 50. Now we're starting to get some women of maybe it should be 45. But my bigger question is that after I went through surgery, chemo, radiation, I am still dealing with my new normal, which is frequent bowel movement um, accompanied with painful cramping. Um, I had a temporary ileostomy that was removed. I maintain this with medication. Just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on a better way to manage this process. Yeah, um, great, great question. So, um, you know, a couple things. We uh, we do, but we have a, we we and a few others around the country develop programs specific for young people with cancer, colon cancer survivors. We have a big we have a big survivorship program in general, but. With act with an act an emphasis on young people with colon and rectal cancer, especially women who have many life altering changes related to the curative therapy. Um, one thing that we unfortunately know is that for many patients, the the goal is of course to not have an ostomy. Nobody wants an ostomy, and yet in fact sometimes the functioning of the rectum following surgery and radiation, the other things we have to do to cure the disease, the, fu- the function is so bad, many times patients would, re- would probably be better off with an ostomy. In current technology, surgeons can fashion ostomies that actually patients can evacuate as, as they wish. They don't necessarily need to have a bag 
as they go around, they you know, in, in out in the community, out in the real world, they may have a band-aid they put over the ostomy and then evacuate as they need to. I mean, that's a that's the best circumstance, it, and you can accomplish that sometimes. But we're very aware of the of the of the if plight of the survivor and the impact on their lives, and much of survivorship these days is trying to figure out what we can, what less we can do. As I mentioned about rectal cancer, for example, we now believe we don't have to radiate nearly the number of patients we've radiated. We think actually in some people with early stage rectal cancer, we can do watch and wait. We can do chemotherapy or chemotherapy and radiation and not even do surgery. Uh, But they have to be very selective and careful about that. So as in general for cancer treatment, you start out your goal is to cure the disease and you may you may do uh, more than you need, and then you try to dial it back and see, uh, you know, what, what damage did we do and how can we avoid some of that damage. It's a long process, but, uh, but I, I hear you loud and clear, and especially in women following rectal cancer, we have a, a lot of quality of life issues that uh, really we need to be much more thoughtful about what we do and how we sub- what we subject those patients to. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Venuk. Uh, what we'll do now is I'm going to read out. Uh, we have some audience questions coming. Uh, so I'll be reading those out, and you can answer them briefly. Um, the first question is, what are the latest findings on treating metastatic HER2 positive colorectal cancer that has not responded to the typical lines of chemotherapy, uh, particularly asking about Herceptin? Right. So... There's 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 this trial, there are a couple of clinical trials that have recently been completed, one called Hercules, Hercules. And in and in general it is a case of patients who have an amplification of the HER2 gene. Now that's not common. It's probably less than five percent of patients with colon, metastatic colon cancer have that genetic amplification. But those patients do get some benefit on average from anti HER2 therapy. The working right now, I think the most interest is in the combination of two blockers of HER2, uh, trastuzumab and protuzumab uh, in combination, but there are other combinations that have been used. Um, it, it's not, the problem is, first of all, it's, un, it's an uncommon finding in patients with advanced colon cancer, and the results are not so spectacular, but but that's a, that is a group that we're looking at. And, Theoretically, this, these are patients who might get greater benefit from treatment earlier on in the course of their disease for her to inj- Right now, as on the average, these patients may uh, start with standard therapy and then we switch to a HER2-based therapy at the time of progression. And you can imagine that we might be better off moving that, the HER2 therapy up earlier, but that's a research question and we're, we're not quite doing that yet. Thank you, Doctor. Um, the next question is, uh, if you could comment on any new possible treatments for PNET in particular that has metastasized to the liver, it would be great. Thank you. So PNET is um, the neuroendocrine can- tumors. PNET is pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but any of these neuroendocrine tumors have a propensity to going to the liver. NET neuroendocrine tumors are unique in that many of them promote, produce hormones, and so they cause they can cause clinical syndromes. The classic example is carcinoid, which are tumors that arise from the intestine and may, for example, make uh, hormones like bradykinins and serotonin, which can cause flushing and blood pressure changes. There are tumors from the pancreas that can make insulin or glucagon. Uh, these weird hormones that have dramatic impact on day-to-day life. Uh, there are lots of treatments for these. It used to be thought that these were rare cancers. Now they're, they're, they're happening more and more, but also people are living much longer. We have, we have drugs, drugs that can turn off the hormone production, something called octreotide, and we have a number of these newer treatments that can block the hormones from being released, these things called, uh, let's say, drug cult like everolimus or sunitinib, these, these all have some effect. Have the most dramatic effect on, nu- on the neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine tumors are, is what's, what is re- essentially radiation to these tumors. You can take a molecule that targets the, the mechanism that leads these cells to 
to, to secrete hormones and by attaching radiation to those that molecule, it's sort of like a magic bullet and this, uh, this so-called peptide-related therapy, you can deliver radiation directly to neuron endocrine cells. That is the most effective new treatment, very dramatically effective in most patients, not available broadly because it's quite labor intensive, but that's the biggest advance and most exciting thing in NET. And again, I'd say the field is evolving where we should we may get newer, newer molecules, ways of targeting, and, and I think that holds out the best hope for that disease. Mm -hmm. Thank you, doctor. Um, the next question is, uh, my husband has stage 4 metastatic rectal cancer, has gone through fall for regimen and radiation. Uh, I heard of treatment called side effect free chemo. Have you heard of this? And will this uh, treatment have any uh, potential in treating the cancer? I've not heard of this, and I have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, side effect free <laughs> chemo, that's sort of an oxymoron. Um, I think... <laughs> It's true that there's some things, so-called targeted therapies, are thought not to be so, have side effects. But they also have side effects. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is: um, the father of my children was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, stage three, in Jan 2017, and died in June. Uh, he died, uh, in, person says, in my opinion, because he couldn't eat. They inserted a stent. It was impossible to eat anything but then the chemo, then the radiation. Everything they did made it worse. As his radiation doctor said, sometimes it's a cure that kills you. It was ironic that they had eradicated the cancer, but he died of starvation. What could have been done differently? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I wasn't there. I'm not sure. It's sometimes you just can't do, you can't do anything differently. Uh, we do yeah. occasionally put tubes in patients and feed them intravenously called total parenteral nutrition. That may be appropriate in some cases. Uh, but, um, you know, again, this is, it, the bad disease requires uh, aggressive treatment and sometimes it's too much. Um, and so that it's very unfortunate, but esophageal cancer in particular, as I said, cancers of the GI tract can have a lot of collateral damage both from treatment and from the disease, and many factors, including nutrition, are, are big problems. So uh, that's a very bad outcome and unfortunate, but that's, uh, that is th that's unfortunate that sometimes we can't help that. Uh, or you'd think we could do better than that, but we may not be able to necessarily. Uh, Dr. Venuk, I will have just one more question before we wrap up today's discussion. Um, could you uh, talk about some of the trials, clinical trials, ongoing clinical trials that uh, folks should be um, keeping track of? Sure. Well, probably the most um, exciting clinical trials relate to the immune therapies. Uh, now, some, in many cases, they've not panned out in, in let's say, colon cancer. But for in liver cancer and other cancers, the progress is, ast is astounding. So one of the first questions to ask with a new diagnosis of, of, a, GI can of a cancer is, is there a role for immunotherapy? There may not be, but if there is, the upside is dramatic because some people have phenomenal benefit from these therapies. Uh, as I said, some of these new radiation techniques to, to isolate the cancer cells and treat them with radiation, sparing the, the tissues, the surrounding tissues, that's, that those represent big advances. Um, and again, I think as we understand the microbiome, hopefully we, we will get, we may get to the point, I would hope that we can change the microbiome and perhaps change the way the body interacts with the cancer. Uh, that's futuristic, but I, I think that we're hoping that that could be even steps, ways of preventing cancer by doing that kind of manipulation. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, but it's um, you know it's it's tough it's it's great to think about and to look forward. It's hard to know what the time frame is and and what, how much advance we can expect to make. But that's, those are the things we're aiming at. Thank you, Dr. Venuk. I think that was a uh, information packed one hour. Thank you very much for your time and all the information that you shared with us, uh, the audience and the panel today. Um, sure. Aki and Kim, thank you so much for participating and questions and the questions uh, you know you've asked to bring in the patient perspective uh, to, to this discussion. 
Uh, we also would like to thank uh, the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and our audience. Uh, this talk will be available at books.com. Uh, so please visit our website for details on upcoming talks. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.